Hi everyone. Way back in 2002, Spider-Man the movie game, which was based on the first Spider-Man film, was released, and it was definitely a game that couldn't be ignored. The game pretty much follows the plot of the film, with the addition of a few more villains. Due to the technical limitations at the time, Spider-Man doesn't actually swing from buildings, but instead just swings from the sky. Also, if Spider-Man is to fall below a certain height, this will result in failing the level. Most levels in the game are played at ground level, and usually follow the same formula of where you must fight waves of enemies before encountering the main villains. How you like me now, punk? Save it. Looks like the freak wants to play. So dead. The environments of the game are quite varied, and there are secret locations in some levels, where if found, can earn you extra bonus points, which you can use to purchase in-game extras. There are health and web refill pickups in the game. There are also gold pickups which allow you to gain new attack combos, I found that one particular combo, the handspring combo, was fairly overpowered and allowed you to deal with most enemies without losing hardly any health. When fighting against the main villains, if you try and engage them in direct hand-to-hand -hand combat, you more than likely will sustain a large amount of damage. The impact web attack is very effective in these fights, so much so that you can essentially use only this attack and within a couple of minutes you will likely defeat your opponent. Tough guy, huh? Let your thingamajig do your fighting for you? The game introduces several villains not featured in the movie, such as Shocker and Vulture. Spider-Man chases after them after witnessing them robbing a jewelry store. He sure took off in a hurry. Yikes! One of the most memorable parts of the game is when you have to go up Vulture's tower, all while he's throwing explosives at you. This is a challenging change of pace in the gameplay, which I found to be one of the most enjoyable levels. One of the story elements that differ from the movie is that Norman is aware of Spider-Man before he becomes the Green Goblin. Like the movie, he is willing to take major risks to ensure that Oscorp secures a military contract instead of their rival's quest labs. But instead of experimenting on himself first, he believes that capturing Spider-Man may help Oscorp to create their performance-enhancing serum. General Slocum has given Oscorp a week to prove that we can develop a working serum. I can only assume that Spider-Man relates to our problem in some way. Oscorp then come across a similar target who has similar DNA to that of Spider-Man. This turns out to be Scorpion, I feel that this was a good way to introduce Scorpion and make him directly relevant to the story. After Oscorp's attempt to capture Spider-Man and Scorpion fail, the game follows the same narrative as the movie, where Norman tries the serum on himself. Mr. 
Osborn. Are you all right? <laughs> And as you saw, things didn't go too well, and he becomes the Green Goblin. The game also has a couple of levels which are more focused on stealth, rather than out and out combat. And these stealth levels are personally my favourite levels in the whole game. In these levels, you are tasked with obtaining data from Oscorp computers. As Spider-Man has realised that the Razorbats Goblin was using have Oscorp branding on them and wants to know what Oscorp has to do with all of this. What the heck was this thing? I need to get home and study it. Maybe it'll give me a clue about Goblin. You have to make use of shadowed areas to hide from the guards. If you're seen, the guards will ring the alarm, and Spider-Man will be met with several armed robots, who in their own words, will approach you with extreme prejudice. These stealth levels are designed very well. Even minor things, such as the way the music dramatically changes when Spider-Man is being hunted by these armed robots, all add to the atmosphere of the game. There are also security light beams which you must avoid, as these too will lead to the armed robots chasing after Spider-Man. If you're feeling brave, you won't last long in a direct conflict with these robots, as they are very overpowered, which basically forces you to use the stealth element in this level. That's it. I'm never saying yes to another 24-hour shift. All right, I'm getting paid double. I'm getting paid double. It's double time. <sighs> There's a lot of humor in the game. Bruce Campbell, the narrator in the training levels, also adds a lot of humor into the game with his commentary. Your compass will point straight towards your next objective. Up on the compass means forward to you. You follow me? Well, stop following me or I'll have you arrested. At times, he also breaks the fourth wall. Okay, the topic at hand is web swinging, but let's get one thing straight first. Do not try this at home. Your house isn't nearly tall enough, okay? Good. Now that the public service message is out of the way, press the R2 button to start web swinging. If you need to floor it, hold down the R2 button while you swing. You'll go faster, sure, but you won't be able to turn worth beans, so watch it. Web swing over to your next objective. Use your compass and height meter to find it. If you can't find it, I can't help you. Unplug the machine and walk away. He often criticizes the player in funny ways. Here's a little party favor for you. A combo power-up. Try to locate as many of these babies as you can. Each time you get one, you'll unlock a new web power or combo to add to your list of attacks. For those of you playing along at home, that's a good thing. Oh, and for those of you with short-term memory issues, which would be most of you, you can check out a list of the combos you've unlocked in the pause menu. Just for giggles, press the punch button near an object to try picking it up. Press punch again to throw it. Don't have time to pick it up? Too lazy? No problem. The kick button will launch an item without picking it up. There. Was that simple enough for you? Or should I play the whole game for you? I feel his contribution to the game definitely adds to the quality of the game, and is very memorable, and one of the longer lasting memories you will have of this game. At least this was the case for me. After completing the game, there is still a large amount of things you can do. The game has many training levels and mini-games. One of these is the basic combat mini-game, in which you are in the ring with waves of Skull Gang members, and after defeating them, you are awarded with Bonesaw himself, who surprisingly isn't that difficult to beat. One of the more enjoyable training levels is the target switching game, which involves you having to lock onto targets and shoot impact web at them. The targets are in the form of musical notes, and you must shoot at them in the order that they light up. This gets progressively harder, and the targets start lighting up much more quickly. This is a fairly challenging but a thoroughly enjoyable minigame, and I would say it's my second favourite in the whole game. My favourite minigame would have to be the Pinhead Bowling, which can be unlocked after earning enough bonus points or by using cheats. Okay, come on. 
What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Spider-Man? Hmm? Bowling, right? Yeah, picture it. Ten thugs lined up, picture perfect, you swing down the lane. At the last moment, you push the kick button and watch those pinheads fly. <laughs> Come on, don't pretend you never thought of it. This is an arcade-like minigame in which you swing and kick the pinheads who are disguised as Skull Gang members. Up to four players can play, making it the most multiplayer-friendly part of the game. If four players are playing, each will have a different character skin, ranging from the normal Spider-Man costume, to Peter Parker wearing normal clothing, to the human spider costume, and finally the alternative Alex Ross design of the Spider-Man costume. It's good to see that this much detail was given to the game, and undoubtedly makes it more enjoyable and adds to the replay value. The actual bowling arena has various easter eggs also. One of these being the fact that a picture of all the game's developers can be seen on the back wall. Small details like this, I feel, do add a lot to the overall atmosphere of the game. Instead of just leaving this wall blank, the developers went the extra mile to add these images and I appreciate the attention to detail. The other training levels consist of various swing challenges, which put you up against a timer. These levels again are arcade style games which keep track of your high score, adding to the replay value and promoting competition, which is especially good for multiplayer. Another minigame which is memorable is the Big Brawl, in which you must defeat waves of enemies within a time limit. The last wave I found to be fairly challenging, and the variety of enemies included in the Big Brawl was something I found to be fairly impressive. They pretty much consist of all the enemies you would have encountered in the main story of the game, apart from the main villains. Once you have finished the game, you will have unlocked some production drawings and bonus cutscene clips. These are compilations of production drawings, accompanied by some music, and these are interesting and enjoyable to view. Some of these are presented in a storyboard format, which correspond to the events of the game and movie, and add an extra level of immersion in the story and its characters. After completing the game, you are also able to replay the game in different character skins, such as Peter Parker or in the human spider clothing. More interestingly, you are also able to play the game as the Green Goblin. You get this option if you beat the game on hero mode or use cheats. Playing as the Green Goblin introduces a whole new story where Harry has found documents that show his dad had hired Skull Gang members and he wants to know what his dad was up to. You play as Harry in the Goblin suit and have full control over the glider and all of its ammunition. I found the experience of playing as the Goblin to be a great addition to the game and was rather impressed with the amount of combos and attack options available. I would have liked to have seen more go into the story element when playing as the Green Goblin. We see that Harry ends up fighting against another goblin, who claims that Norman got rid of him when he failed to kill Spider-Man. Your father hired me to kill Spider-Man. He gave me the suit and some razor bats. Liar! Shut your mouth! Harry ends up defeating this goblin at the end, rescuing Mary Jane in the process, just like in the main game when you play as Spider-Man. However, there are a few unanswered questions, such as the true identity of this goblin, and what his intentions were. While it would have been nice to have had a more cohesive storyline for the goblin, the fact that the option to play as the Green Goblin even exists is a major credit to this game. Playing as the Green Goblin could have just been a character skin, but an actual alternative storyline was created, along with full glider controls and weapons. Clearly a lot of thought went into this, and it's something that a lot of players would have probably missed on first playthrough. I only discovered you could play as the Green Goblin a few years ago. When I originally played the game close to the time it released, I had never known this was possible. The Xbox version of the game has two exclusive levels, which involve a new villain, Craven the Hunter. 
Norman hires Craven to capture Spider-Man. Craven starts a fire at a zoo, luring Spider-Man to him. These levels are very well designed, with Spider-Man having to navigate through a series of Prince of Persia-like traps. You must do so as fast as possible, as Craven has released a poisonous gas which slowly decreases Spider-Man's health. I had previously not known about these levels, as I had only played the PlayStation version of the game. These levels add enough depth to the game to make the Xbox version the best version of the game. They add a nice change of pace in the gameplay and do resonate with me especially, as they remind me of the Prince of Persia games, which were some of my favorite games back in the day. If all these extras are not enough, the game also has many cheats which can be used. Some of these cheats allow you to play in different character skins, such as Shocker and even Uncle Ben's Killer. Using these cheats can lead to some humorous encounters, such as Shocker fighting against himself or Uncle Ben's Killer kissing Mary Jane in the final cutscene. The funniest cheats, however, have to be being able to make your character and enemies have a big head and big feet. This can lead to some hilariously awkward cutscenes, where Mary Jane can kiss Spider-Man in the last cutscene whilst being double his size and vice versa. You are also able to make your character much smaller than everyone else, which is also somewhat amusing. Other cheats include a so-called Matrix attack mode, which slows down your attacks and makes them look more cinematic as you can see. Back off, ugly. One interesting detail I found was when you wear the Alex Ross Spider-Man costume, in the final fight against Goblin, Green Goblin also has an alternate costume. I like that small details like these that many players wouldn't even have known about are included in this game. The physics in the game can create some funny situations such as enemies sometimes being right on the edge of a building for an extended period of time before falling to their death. When swinging around the city or flying in the glider as Goblin, you can often hear comments from the civilians down below, which are mostly positive but some are critical, which does lead to a humorous back and forth from Spider-Man or Goblin. Yeah, same to you, buddy. For me, the fact that this game has small details like this undoubtedly make it a better experience. It's clear that it was developed with great attention to detail, and the numerous mini-games and being able to play as Goblin all add to the longevity and are what makes this game very memorable. While the swinging mechanics and physics definitely show their age, the sheer amount of content in this game is something I admire and the fact they were able to get Tobey Maguire to voice Spider-Man also adds to the quality of the game. No matter how much you want to hold on to a moment, you can't stop time from moving on. This along with Bruce Campbell's humorous narration throughout make the game, in my opinion, still hold up after all this time. A lot of the limitations of this game, such as only being able to swing from the sky, were improved drastically in the sequel, which I plan to review also. I do plan to upload much more regularly and plan to make more analysis videos for classic games such as this. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment and subscribe. Goodbye.